Hi everyone, my name is Jamil Sheikh. I am the CEO of a couple of different companies and a professor at a couple of different universities. I'm here to talk about uh, a very interesting topic around the doubts and um, miscommunication and misinformation around emerging technologies like blockchain, NFTs, and metaverse. Now, the technology industry is full of doubts. If you go back to the time when email first came out, people thought email was not necessary. You could still continue to use mail. Uh, at the time, there was a uh, the ability to use your credit card online. People said, why would you use your credit card online? And there were significant doubts um, in technology and in the in world uh, in general about how these things can work. Today, we have the same type of doubts in the blockchain space, in the NFT space, in the metaverse space. And I'm going to look to address some of those doubts and bring some interesting perspectives around what these things really fundamentally are, the kind of the underlying and underpinning, uh, the philosophical underpinnings of what these things are, um, so that we can see where this is going to take us as a human civilization down the road. So I want to first start with level setting what blockchain is, right? So blockchain really solves two problems, right? The first problem is this idea that if I give you a PDF, let's say it's a PDF of a book, let's say it's War and Peace, I give you that PDF, I still have a copy of that PDF, and you now have a copy of that PDF, the probability of that PDF of gaining any value greater than zero is itself zero meaning that there is no chance that the, prob that the value of that PDF goes beyond zero because there's an abundance of supply. And so what blockchain solves is the idea that if a digital thing like this PDF was born and, and is created on the blockchain, if I transfer that digital thing, we can call it a digital asset, and I transfer it to you, therefore I no longer have it, therefore there is a chance now, there's a probability greater than or equal to zero that that digital thing can have value. That is profoundly uh, important, meaning they can change how we do business going forward. So that's the first problem that blockchain solves. The second problem that blockchain solves, uh, which actually is solved um, is this transfer of digital uh, asset, is through an intermediary, meaning that if I transfer money to you, there is a ledger where a certain amount of money is removed from me and it's added to your account, is solved through an, through an intermediary like a bank, but with the blockchain, it's possible to do that without an intermediary. So there is nothing more to blockchain than the idea that these two problems are solved. The minute I send something to you, a digital thing that I send, that was created on a blockchain, and I send it to you, uh, it no longer exists in my possession. That allows for the probability of value to accumulate. That doesn't guarantee value is going to accumulate, but it allows for the chance for the value to accumulate. Now, we have blockchains, and we have things that are occurring in blockchain. If you've been listening to the news, there's a lot that's going on in the blockchain space. And there's a notion of fungibility and non-fungible tokens. And fung fungibility is basically the idea that if I trade a like-kind asset with you, there is zero probability of a loss or gain by either party. So if I gave you a $5 bill, and you gave me a $5 bill, there is zero probability of either one of us sustaining a loss or, 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 or obtaining a gain. That's not the case with non-fungible things. Non-fungible things are things that we find uh, pretty much in nature. Right? Uh, these are things that are unique. And on the blockchain, a digital thing, much like the PDF that I mentioned earlier, in this case, we can call it a token, right? that is non-fungible, represents something that's unique in the world. Right? That could be potentially a piece of art, and we see a lot of that artwork today. It could represent a house, it could represent a car, it could represent a credit default swap, it could represent a municipal bond, right? So all of these things are representable by a non-fungible token, what we call today NFTs, but the current use case is artwork, and that's gonna grow and continue to expand into other different use cases. If I were to trade my house for your house, right, there is some probability, it's highly likely that one of us is gonna gain or one of us is gonna lose some money because it's very low, it's a very low chance that the houses are of equal and identical value for trading. Therefore, it's a non-fungible asset. So we have this world, emerging world of non-fungible tokens, and we see a lot of that happening in the, in the art world. Now, what we see in the art world, there is an enormous amount of news about this, is missing the greater point of the NFT uh, market, or what's actually happening in the NFT market. It's not about um, the art, it's about provenance. Right, the idea of provenance, when you sign a document, you put, you put your signature on a document, you're effectively creating an NFT. 
right? So the, the fact that your hands touch that signature um, is very much similar to the idea that an NFT is created by an artist, right? So if you take provenance, and what provenance means is, to, is the origin uh, of, of, of a thing. So wh where did it come from? How was it created? And who created it? If you take provenance and break it down into its components, the most important components are really three. One, community. Two, story. Three, the creator, right? These three things combined together create a very strong uh, sense of provenance. I can give you an example. Let's take a community, for example, and let's do a thought exercise. Imagine we live in a world where nobody exists except you, right? Just one person exists. And in that world, what would you own, right? So what would you own in a world where nobody else exists? And the common answer that I typically receive is everything or nothing, right? And what it really means is that the word ownership has no meaning outside of the context of community, right? So uh, the idea of ownership is dependent upon the idea of community or society and a functioning society. The second component of provenance is story, the idea of the people and how they evolved around a particular thing or a particular person and the creator, right? The individual that created uh, the asset. Imagine I have a Mona Lisa here, the original Mona Lisa here, and I took a photo of that Mona Lisa. Can I claim that that Mona Lisa is a, a copy of the uh, original Mona Lisa? The answer is no, right? I cannot sell that digital version of the Mona Lisa and hope to gain the same value that the original, value, uh, original Mona Lisa would sell for, right? That's probably not gonna be possible. Similarly, I can take the Mona Lisa and make an atomic replica of it, meaning atom for atom replica of it, right? And I'm pretty sure people will not pay for the clone as much as they would pay for the original. Yet we have an identical copy of the original. So what does, what's the difference between the two? The difference is very, very simple. In the first original case, Leonardo da Vinci's hands did not touch the clone, it touched the original, right? So by touching the original, that's the root of the provenance. And our ability to be able to find and verify that provenance is part of what community and story enforces. We know how things were passed, we know where the, the Mona Lisa sits, which museum it sits in, all that information, that story stays with us and is carried through, um, through generations, through community. Uh, so that component, these two components, the community, the story, um, and the creator combine together, the three components combine together to intertwine and, and bring us uh, provenance. Right? If you look at the idea of provenance, if I were to take a piece of artwork and I go to a uh, reseller, or if I go to, for example, a Christie's, they are going to verify that provenance at some cost, uh, for some fee. With the blockchain and NFT, the benefit I have is the cost of provenance goes down to near zero. Meaning in order for me to verify the provenance of a thing, the cost of it is zero because I can easily readily do that uh, on a blockchain. So what this means is that the physicality of the object, meaning if I have a Mona Lisa, because it's physical, is incidental to provenance. It is not central to provenance, right? The value of an asset is not uh, dependent on the fact that it's physical, the value of an asset is dependent on its provenance. Um, and what blockchain allows and what NFTs allow is for provenance to be more readily verified, uh, elim potentially eliminating fraud, reducing fraud, um, and allowing the cost of ascertaining and verifying that provenance uh, more readily possible. If you take a look at Banksy's art, Banksy took a piece of art and shredded it live during um, an auction, the value of that piece of art grew because the story of that art became more and more, more relevant. And, and what you'll find in the NFT space is the same idea, that the fact that I can ascertain the provenance and the story of some digital asset means that that asset can now start to have value. Imagine Goldman Sachs issues a credit default swap and somebody from some local place issues the same credit default swap. You as a banker, which credit default swap would you more, more be readily able to trust or willing to trust? Most likely you'd be willing to trust the Goldman Sachs issued credit default swap because its provenance 
is from Goldman Sachs. In the same way, if I sign a document uh, and somebody else signs and forges my document, the provenance of the forged document is now different because even though the digital or the, the ink looks exactly the same on the forged document, let's say it's exactly the same, the provenance of that signature is not the same. So NFTs are not about artwork. They're not about um, all this money that's moving around, although that is happening and it is great. Uh, what it really is about is community, story, provenance, and the creator all intertwining together. We have the same phenomenon in the metaverse world, right? In the metaverse world, which we think is a digital reality, right, um, is really a function of community, right? When I log into a metaverse world, I'm interacting with other people. Uh, it's digital. Um, and the detractors will say that this is really uh, a fake reality or this is not really real. So the question really becomes is what is reality? And the, the com very common uh, exercise here is to ask, how do you determine what is reality? I'm standing before you, you actually have no evidence that I exist outside of your mind. There is no proof if you, let's say for example, talk to your, a loved one, a, your mother or your brother or your sister or a son or your daughter, you actually have no proof that they exist outside of your mind. There is no way for you to prove that. So effectively, reality is a belief, right? The fact that we see what we see, we believe it for, it for it to exist, and we've gotten so used to that belief, we take it for granted. What metaverse is, is to take what we call this digital reality and make the, the line, that thick line that differentiates between the virtual and real, make that line thinner and thinner. Right? And we've seen the precursors of, of, of metaverse, social media, the fact that you sit down in a theater uh, and watch a movie because you want to escape from rea reality, but you want to do it with other people, right? So the precursors of metaverse, it, the digital metaverse, are these other digital things, but we can go back and say, actually the metaverse started much, much longer ago, much, much, sorry, we can say that the metaverse started much, uh, much earlier, maybe thousands of years ago, right? The first metaverse could be language, right? The fact that I can construct an idea in my mind and I might use language to construct that idea, right? Because language gives me the barriers and the semantics and the parameters to construct these ideas. And then I can convey these ideas that don't exist in the physical world into your mind through language. So maybe the first metaverse is language and maybe the second metaverse is paper, right? The fact that I can draw things and create things and write words and construct things that are in my mind that don't exist in quote unquote reality and put it onto a vehicle or a medium that then can communicate to you and then construct those things in your mind is a form of metaverse. And if I just carry that over and say, well, we're just going to do it and make it digital. Then the fact that the metaverse is something that's constructed in our mind or is constructed in somebody else's mind is unimportant. What is important is, is this a community that I want to belong to? Is this giving me the joy and pleasure that I want, that I typically get, let's say, if I'm going to binge watch a Netflix show? Or, and is this going to give me uh, the sense of belonging that we as humans are looking for through community and through story? And what we're going to see going down in the next decade is this continuous march of metaverse uh, and blockchain and NFTs growing. We'll see in 10 years that all B2B commerce will be NFT based. If I send you an invoice, you send me um, a receipt, it will all be NFT based. We might not even refer to it as NFT. It might not be even something that we even think about or talk about, but under underlying all of uh, civilization will be the blockchain infrastructure that addresses the movement of, of value. Um, and then we'll start to see the convergence of metaverse and blockchain where if I sell you a battle axe in my metaverse game, um, that, battle, that, that trade occurs through the blockchain. So as we continue to grow and expand in our understanding of reality and the understanding of, of value, what the metaverse and NFT are doing is making the transfer of value and the re understanding of reality more and more believable. Thank you.